Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Genetic Genealogy Ireland Dublin 2018. This is our second event of the year, we had our first event up in Belfast in February, so it's great to see so many people in the room. It's also great to have us live on Facebook, so this is being streamed across the world, and we're also recording this for the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel. Uh, this uh, presentation and uh, most of the presentations will go up online sometime in November over the course of several weeks. So it is uh, great to be back here again. Uh, this session, uh, all of these lectures are sponsored by Family Tree DNA, so I'd like to give a very big thank you to Family Tree DNA for sponsoring us for the last six years to give these DNA lectures and broadcast them around the world. And it's organized by uh, members of ISOG, so volunteers from ISOG, like myself, like Debbie, ISOG is the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and you are all welcome to join. So please go downstairs and uh, check that out. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the session, which is Debbie Kennett. And Debbie is going to talk to, uh, talk to us about DNA for beginners. Now, Debbie is a seasoned genetic genealogist. She has been around since the beginning because she was very interested in her own particular project, which was uh, the Cruise DNA project. She has a um, blog called Cruise News, and uh, that is a very, very popular blog. Uh, we, she also has, is an author of several books, and she's also an honorary clinical research associate with University College London. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Debbie Kennett. Thank you very much, Morris. Oh, am I oh, switched on? I will unmute you. <laughs> oh. There we go. Oh. Okay, we're ready to go. Well, thank you very much, Morris, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, now, I have put my a PDF version of my slides up on uh, Dropbox, so feel free to take a photograph of that. And I don't mind if you want to take photographs of my slides throughout the talk and share them on Twitter or anywhere else you want to do so, uh, as long as you don't use them again uh, for your own purposes. Okay, so first of all, um, how many people in the room have actually had their DNA tested? Wow, that's... <laughs> so I'm doing a talk for beginners. I, I was rather under the assumption everyone here wouldn't have tested, so I'm actually really surprised and encouraged by, uh, by that uh, response. Um, so um, one of the things I always say to people before they test is to think about what you want to learn from a DNA test. Um, so this is me as a little baby. I was born in uh, Gloucestershire, and so I have a British passport, so you may think I'm 100% British. Uh, my mum was born in Deptford in London, but my dad, he was born in Cork in Ireland. So does that mean I'm now 50% British, 50% Irish? If you go back through the generations, my dad, although he was born in Ireland, his parents were both born in England and most of my ancestry is actually from the UK. And as I go further back in time, I've got Ireland and Scotland creeping into my family tree there. And if we go back even further, um, once, uh, our, the number of our ancestors starts to double every generation. And once you get back to um, like 16 generations, you have thousands and thousands of ancestors. Once you go back a thousand years, we all have a billion ancestors, more ancestors than humans who have ever existed. So what that means is all of our pedigrees are these complicated uh, trees like this of lots of interconnecting ancestors. So if you want to take a DNA test, the question is which ancestor do you want to find out about? And there are particular tests that will tell you about a specific ancestor. Or do you want to find out about your whole family tree and how do we represent that complexity. And so the companies will all promise that the DNA test will tell you who you are and where you really come from, but it's not quite as simple as that. Now, a DNA test is very useful, it's a very useful tool, but it is just one tool that we use. And I think you need to think of it as a genealogical record, and like any other type of record that we use, you don't use DNA on its own, you use it in combination with other records. There are some rare occasions when a DNA test can actually 
be a life-changing, can initiate a life-changing discovery process, but for most people, it's not going to upturn your life. And with DNA, it relies that the, the way we get the value out of the DNA test is not just by testing ourselves, but by who else is in the database and who we match in the database and how we match those people. So the power of DNA testing lies in this combination of DNA with genealogical records. And this is what we call genetic genealogy. And the power of genetic genealogy is increasing we, now that we have some really massive databases. So the first test became available in the year 2000. And in those days, there were only two different types of tests, Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. I started in 2007, and a lot of people had never even heard of DNA testing for genealogy in those days. And then in 2009, we had the first autosomal DNA test, but it's really from about well, 2013, 2014 onwards, as the price of the test started to come down, and uh, we started to see companies advertising on TV, um, and it really started to take off. So more people tested in 2017 than in all the previous years combined. And that number is going to keep growing and growing, and we're eventually going to have millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people throughout the world who have tested. So we have three different types of test. The first test is a Y chromosome DNA test. Only males have a Y chromosome, so only males can take this test. And this test follows this all male surname line. And I'm going to be covering all three tests as we go through the, the talk. The second test is the mitochondrial DNA test, which tells you about your all female line. Both males and females have mitochondrial DNA, so anyone can take this test but it only tells you about your female ancestors on that one specific line. And the third test is the autosomal DNA test, which gives you matches with genetic cousins who are related to you on all of your different ancestral lines, but it's best used for making connections within about the last five or six generations. So just a little bit of very basic biology. In every cell in our body, we have... Um, we have that there's a nucleus of the cell, and within that cell are these structures called chromosomes, which are the genetic code, sometimes called the blueprint of life. And chromosomes come in pairs. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 from our mother, 22 from our sorry, 23 from our mother, 23 from our father, and 22 of those are known as the autosomes, which are like a patchwork of DNA from all four of your grandparents. And then the final pair are the sex chromosomes. So, so if you're a male, you will have a Y chromosome and a, from your father, an X chromosome from your mother. If you're a female, you'll have two X chromosomes. So uh, if you take a DNA test, you always need to be prepared for the unexpected. And this was the case from the early days onwards, but we are seeing this happening more and more. Once you start to get databases of millions of people, the one in a million surprise is going to happen to a fair number of people. So one of the things that could potentially happen is you may find close relations that you didn't know existed. And we see this happen quite a lot. Um, this uh, particular case, uh, uh, um, a lady called Kathy took a DNA test and she discovered a half-brother that she knew nothing about. She was in Ireland, he was in London, he was adopted, given up for adoption at the age of six months and knew nothing about his family. And as a result of that DNA test, he found not just Cathy, but he found that she was one of nine siblings. So he went from having no family at all to having nine siblings. Um, and the other thing that you may find is that you are not who you thought you were. So this is a an absolutely incredible story of a, a lady called Alice Plabouk who took a DNA test just out of curiosity um, in the early days and she was expecting the results to come back that she was like 50% Jewish um, but it came back that she was 50% sorry she was expecting 50% Irish and she came back 50% Jewish um, so she went on this long process of doing a huge amount of detective work. She tested all her siblings. They came back and they matched her as full siblings. And it eventually transpired that her father wasn't um, Irish at all. And he was the one where the discrepancy had occurred. So they, they tested, uh, uh, various other people tested, and eventually 
um, it transpired that her father, when he was born, he was in hospital, and there were two babies born on the same day um, in this same hospital, and the parents had actually taken home the wrong babies. So the Jewish parents had taken home the Irish baby, the Irish parents had taken home the Jewish baby. And this came to light all these years later. And there are actually four cases now we know of where hospital mix-ups have occurred. So that's four in 12 million, but there may be a few more in the future. And I've got the links in the, the PDS here, so both of those stories are well worth reading, especially the, uh, the hospital mix-up story there. Okay, so I'm just going to look at the, um, the, the each uh, individual test in turn. So Y chromosome DNA testing is this all male surname line. Um, now for Y chromosome testing, Family Tree DNA, the only company that we can use for genealogy purposes, they're the only company who have a matching database where you can match with other people who share your surname. And to get the most out of this test, you really need to be in a surname project and if you're the first person who've tested with your surname you're not really going to get much out of it but um, there are a lot of very active Irish projects now and I think most Irish surnames will be represented in the project so you'll have a good chance of matching someone. Um, so Family Tree DNA also do mitochondrial DNA testing and autosomal DNA testing so it's the only company where you can actually take a test and have all three results in in one account used for genealogy purposes. So there are a whole range of surname projects. I just put up the, the page here of the McCarthy surname project, which is one of the um, really nicely run ones. And the, the project admins, they're all volunteers, but they will help you to understand your results and they will put you in groups on the project results page. And if there isn't a project for your surname, there are also lots of geographical projects. So there's a very large Ireland DNA project and there's a whole range of regional projects that you can join for Ireland. And when you get your results, this is what the results page looks like. So I don't have a Y chromosome, but I've tested my father. So this is what his page looks like. And the important part on this page is the, um, the, the, the matches. And we'll click through, and this is what my dad's match page looks like now. So his surname is Cruz, C-R-U-W-Y-S. And you can see he matches other people with the surname Cruz. But he... Where's the... Um, the pointer. The pointer. It's that little red um, one just... Oh, there. Right. Okay. Move that down slightly. Right. Okay. Okay, so you can see on his matches, he matches other people with his surname Cruz but he also matches other people with different surnames. And that is quite common because obviously not all surnames originated at the same time. And some of these matches actually go back quite a long way as well. But we've now got the confirmation from DNA testing that this surname Cruz goes back a very, very, very long way. And then the results, we put them in a surname project like this and then we group them into what we call genetic families. So all the people in this group, they're all related to each other. This new colour bar here, that means all these people are related to each other and another group here, and it goes on down the page. So um, I think for most, certainly for most Irish people, when you take a test, you're likely to find someone who, who's, who matches you, but it's not necessarily the case for everyone. And the other thing that we can get out of the Y chromosome test is um, information about our deep ancestry, and this is through what we call a haplogroup. So you will get a haplogroup assignment, and that tells you which branch of the human Y-DNA tree you belong to. In each of those branches, they have origins in different parts of the world. So if for Irish people, the majority haplogroup is haplogroup R1b, which is right down the bottom of the uh, chart here in the corner. And the other one you may find is haplogroup I, and sometimes you get... Um, haplogroups, show, odd haplogroups showing up. Um, so haplogroup A is normally found in Africa, but it did show up in some men in Yorkshire a few years ago. Haplogroup H is normally found in India, but if you were, say, a Romney gypsy, um, something like 50%, I think it's something like 25% of Romney gypsies turn out to be haplogroup H because they had a, an ancient origin in India. So you'll be hearing much more about haplogroups and SNP testing. There's all sorts of advanced tests that you can do if you're interested in exploring this side of your uh, family history. 
Um, but just to give you an example of how why DNA testing works, I just wanted to share with you a story from my own surname project. And uh, I, many years ago, I had somebody approaching me about his ancestor, Henry Cruz, um, who was shipwrecked off the coast of South Africa. And uh, the, according to family legend, uh, Henry was the only person who survived the shipwreck, and that was because he was able to swim, and he managed to swim to shore, and uh, then he lived in South Africa. And the bay in South Africa is actually named Harry's Bay in his honour. And when we started to do the family history research, the records in South Africa are actually very difficult to obtain, and we got a death notice which told us that Henry was aged 36 years when he died, his mother's name was Mary, and he was born in Great Britain. So, okay, is that what gives us, narrows down the choice to three countries, and we've got a birth date of 1826 approximately, but it's before all the censuses. So he was actually one of the first people to join my surname project, and when he first tested, he had no matches at all. But eventually the matches did start to come in, and um, now this is what his match page looks like. And you can see that all the people on his match list, they all have most distant known ancestors from three of them from a little village in Wiltshire and the other one from a little village in Berkshire. And in fact, I've been able to link that family tree to this one. So now, even though we ha cannot make the paper trail link, we know that Henry Cruz must somehow fit into this family tree. We think it, the, the connection is somewhere through London, which is always a challenge to do, but I think eventually we will be able to work out what that connection is. So sometimes DNA testing can be very, very powerful in actually providing answers when you have a, a brick wall, just simply through the, the, through the matches that you get. The second test I wanted to discuss is the mitochondrial DNA test, which follows this all-female line. It's passed on from a mother to all of her children, both male and female, but it's only the females who pass it on to the next generation. So this works in the same way. When you take a test of family tree DNA, you will get a list of matches like this. And my matches are all quite distant, and I've got people who share ancestry from they've got Spain, Romania, but I don't have any exact matches, and it's really only the exact matches that we're interested in with this test. Um, now, family tree DNA do give us a chart where they um, estimate that if you have an exact match, your common ancestor lived um, about 550 years ago. Although the, the charts there, we've not been able, Andrew Millard has, not, has tried to reproduce those figures and has not been able to, and we think that they, it may actually be much, much more distant than that. And with mitochondrial DNA, you also get a haplogroup. And these haplogroups, they, the letters and numbers don't correspond with the Y DNA ones, but they also have their own geographical distribution. So if you ended up being a haplogroup A, B, or C or D, you'll probably have na Native American ancestry, which I think is probably unlikely for someone from Ireland. If you were haplogroup L, you'd probably be from Africa. Um, and if you were haplogroup M, you're probably from India. And then in Europe, we have a whole range of haplogroups, and it's haplogroup H that is the most common. About 40% of um, people in Europe are haplogroup H. And sometimes the haplogroup itself can be um, unexpected and informative. So a few weeks ago, I was at the Families in British India Society, and they are actually using mitochondrial DNA testing because um, a lot of them have an, an ancestor, a female ancestor from India, and they will end up coming out with an Indian haplogroup, haplogroup M. And often that is the only evidence, the only record that they have of that Indian ancestor. And the most famous um, application of uh, mitochondrial DNA testing for genealogy purposes is Richard III. And this is a good example of how it's not just DNA testing on its own that provides the answers, it's all the records combined together. So it was an amazing feat of genealogical research. They, they, they had to trace the line of descent. So Richard III, his, his mitochondrial DNA is not passed on to anyone. So they had to go to his sister and then trace the line of descent from his sister, Anne of York, 
right down to the present generation, from female to female to female. I think it was you know, 13 generations on one side to get to Michael Ibsen, and 15 generations on the other side to get to Wendy Daldig. And then they compared the results of Michael Ibsen and Wendy Daldig with the remains, and they, one of them had an exact match, I believe, and the other one was just a one mismatch. So they had confirmation from the mitochondrial DNA, but the Y DNA um, did not, of the people that they tested, did not match the remains. So they then did a, a, a statistical analysis looking at all the evidence, um, so it's things like the scoliosis, and when you look at that, there was only a very small number of people who would have had scoliosis at the time. The mitochondrial DNA, ev DNA evidence was in favour of the identification, the Y DNA evidence was not in favour, but when you added it all together, they came up with an assessment that was 99.999% certain that the remains were that of Richard III. But it wasn't mitochondrial DNA that provided the answer, it was everything combined together. Okay, so the third test is the autosomal DNA test, which will give you matches with genetic cousins on all of your ancestral lines. And there are now five different companies that will offer this test. Um, so 23andMe were actually the first company to offer this test, but their test is really more focused on uh, medical issues. And um, Family, Family Tree were the second company to, uh, to launch this test, and then Ancestry DNA joined the market, MyHeritage and Living DNA. And um, if you test at 23andMe or Ancestry, they will not accept transfers, but if you, test, when, if you test with those companies, you can do a free transfer to Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and also Living DNA at the moment. Although that is starting to change at MyHeritage, they, they're going to be ending the free transfers in February. And at Family Tree DNA, although you get the matches free, you have to pay $19 to get the um, so-called ethnicity report. And I think Living DNA, it's only through Find My Pass at the moment, they're doing those free transfers, and I think you'll have to pay at some point for the extra features. So what the, the tests are divided into two parts. You get, with the test, you get the cousin matches, which I'll cover later, but you also get um, what's officially called a biogeographical ancestry analysis. The companies call them ethnicity estimates, although really ethnicity is, is not genetic. It's really how you define your, your own identity. Um, and you'll find that the results will vary from company to company and also from each company will update the results. So I was recently updated at Ancestry DNA. I was originally 21% um, Great Britain according to their results and then overnight I went from being 21% Great Britain to 94% Great Britain. And I dropped from being, I was 20% Irish on the old version of the test and now it's dropped to 6%. Uh, so <laughs> um, and Ancestry also have what they call um, regions, so they will also assign you to particular communities, and this is using a different type of methodology, and it's using information from the matches, and these are actually accurate within about the last 200 years, so if they put you in a community for, say, Cork or Kerry, then it's pretty certain that you have got some ancestors from those places, but you'll note that there's a big gap, and there's nothing for Leinster, um, so that's, it's because these communities are really more of a reflection of the sort of history of the, of the, the regions and the more that people uh, sort of marry within their communities, the more these regions show up in the results. And here I am at 23andMe, I am 59.7% British and Irish here and I've got some French and German, which I didn't have at Ancestry, some I some Scandinavian and broadly Northwest European. And um, it's different again at my heritage. Here I've got a nice 12% Italian, which uh, no one else uh, seems to detect. Um, and you will find this is common. If you, if you test with all the different companies, you will get these different results. At Family Tree DNA, I am now 100% um, British. My husband, who has all British ancestry, 15% British. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But um, if you look at the broader picture, all the results give this broad picture of you know, Northwest European ancestry. So the, 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 the big details are, are all accurate. It's the, the finer details that don't seem to be um, quite so reliable. But um, I think that's also a problem. It's, you just cannot capture the complexity of someone's ancestry with a, a simple DNA test. <coughs> Living DNA is um, a new British company that is set up, which is, um, they specialise in, at the moment, they've got access to data from the people of the British Isles Project. So if you have mostly British ancestry, they will be able to give you a very fine regional breakdown. Um, it doesn't work so well for Ireland at the moment, but they are trying to get reference panels for Ireland to give that same um, breakdown for Ireland. So for me, those results do correspond pretty well with my known ancestry, but they tend to produce, if, you, if you're, say, from America and have very distant ancestry, they tend to provide very over-precise results, and people with, say, German ancestry get, end up having results for um, uh, English counties, which isn't really relevant to them. So the, the other part of the test is the, the matches, um, and this is really the, the most useful and the most important part of the, the test. Um, so um, the matching um, works, so first of all, if I just explain how DNA is inherited. So we each get 50% of our DNA from our parents, from each parent, um, and we get on average 25% of our DNA from our grandparents. And the DNA that we get from our parents is this sort of patchwork of the DNA of all four of our grandparents. But the, the, there's a wide variation around those averages. So you may only get 19% of your DNA from one grandma, and you may get 31% of your DNA from your grandpa on that side of your family. And then as you go further back in time, we've got an average 12.5% from the previous generation, 6.25% from the previous generation. But you will find that you get more DNA from some ancestors than you get from others. And we can then use the, the, the information about the amount of DNA shared to make predictions about relationships. So if you share 100% of, of your DNA with someone, you, you're either matching yourself and you've tested yourself and you've forgotten about it, which some people do, and, or you've got an identical twin. And if you share 50% of your DNA, then it has to be a parent-child relationship or a full sibling relationship. And there are ways of distinguishing between them. But once you start to get further out, if you share 25% of your DNA, then there are a number of different um, possible explanations for that relationship. So again, it's, if you don't have the genealogical information, you have to go back to the genealogy records to try and work out what the relationship is. And it actually becomes, starts to become much more difficult once you get out beyond the sort of third, fourth cousin level because of this random variation in the, the way that DNA is inherited. So here is a representation of my family tree. And the thing that we find is that once you go beyond about six or seven, five or six or seven generations, you have some ancestors in your family tree who are your genealogical ancestors, but who are not your genetic ancestors. So you may have a match with someone and you may have a legitimate genealogical relationship with them, but it won't, just won't show up in your match list. So with um, autosomal DNA testing, it's really important to make sure, first of all, you test the oldest generation and get them tested while you have the chance to do so. Because by testing myself and I've tested my parents, that takes me back one more generation and fills in some of those blanks there. And if you can't test yourself, you can test, say, siblings or aunts and uncles. And so if you test a sibling, your sibling will have a completely different representation of, of your ancestry than you and may pick up matches that you don't have. So you can just take a test if you want to, just to see what it throws up in the, in the database. Um, but uh, if you want to take it, some, a lot of people want to take a test because they've got a particular hypothesis that they want to explore. So if you wanted to test your second cousin to make sure that you really are second cousins, we know from test results that 
it, 99% of second cousins should show up as matches. We've not yet had a case of a, a second cousin who does not show up as a match where the reason is that they were not um, genealogically related. But once you get out to the third cousin level, you will find some third cousins who will just will not appear in your match list purely because of the random way that DNA is inherited. But what you would expect is if you test lots of people from the same family, so if you were to test yourself and all your siblings, um, it may be that you don't match that third cousin, but you would expect at least some of those other siblings to match. And at the fourth cousin level, um, it's, you know, Ancestry claims 71%. That's a sort of theoretical amount. Um, the other companies say around about 50%. Um, but around about 50% of uh, fourth cousins should match. And then it, uh, as you get more, as the relationships become more distant, the chances of actually sharing a, uh, a match with a specific ancestor start to drop off um, quite rapidly. But the other side of the coin is that we all have huge numbers of sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth, and 20th cousins, so when you take one of these DNA tests, you'll find that the vast majority of your matches are these very, very distant matches. So this is what my match list looks like at Ancestry DNA. So I've tested both my parents, and luckily there were no surprises there. And um, I've got a couple of second cousins who've tested there now, and at Family Tree DNA, at Ancestry, you can click through and you can see the trees there. And I've got uh, something like 20,000 matches there, but most of them are the very distant matches and it, it's really only the, the close matches you want to worry about. And it's the same thing at Family Tree DNA. Again, they give you the, um, I've tested my parents there and they give you a prediction of the relationship and they have a nice feature where they list the surnames and if the surnames are shared, then it's highlighted in bold. And what you will find is each company has a different database. So it's, especially if you're on a, what we call a fishing trip, it's important to be in all the different databases. Because, and, and Family Tree DNA have been doing this for longer, so they've got people um, who've, say, taken Y chromosome tests back in the early days who are now deceased, but those results can still be used and people can upgrade those results, but those people can't be tested elsewhere because the, the sample isn't available. So I've got a third cousin who just tested recently at uh, Family Tree DNA who is not at Ancestry, and I've got people who've tested at Ancestry who aren't at Family Tree DNA. Um, the other thing that we get at Family Tree DNA, in fact, just yesterday I had to change my slides yet again because they'd launched a new chromosome browser. Um, so this is a feature you get at Family Tree DNA that you don't get at Ancestry DNA. And this is a representation of my son and his two grandparents. And it can be interesting just to do this process of mapping chromosomes just to help you understand how the inheritance process works. And you can see here my son and his two grandparents how um, he's inherited in certain chromosome 12 there he's actually got the entire um, red entire chromosome uh, 18 from his father and um, this one he's got almost entire chromosome 13 from his sorry from his, um, his his grandmother and just a tiny little bit from his grandfather but you can see how the chromosomes slot together so you can see how it's like little teeth here that they they all join together so his so my, so that actually is also a representation of the chromosome that I've got, that he's inherited from me. Um, and then what you can do is, if you then match someone else, actually the colours don't show up very well on here, but this is a match with a third cousin, twice removed. And can you see that little green, it's supposed to be, what's green on my slides? But that is where my son matches this particular person. And because we know that he's inherited that red bit of his um, chromosome from his grandfather, we know that that bit of his chromosome has been inherited from his, his paternal grandfather. So um, you, you'll hear um, Catherine Borges talking this afternoon about um, Johnny Painter's tool, uh, DNA Painter, where you can actually do all this painting with your chromosomes and actually work out which bits of your DNA came from which of your ancestors. And eventually we'll be able to even reconstruct our ancestors from, our, from their genomes if we get enough people uh, tested. 
So that particular green segment there, um, I am now able to say that that little bit of DNA in me and in my son came from that particular couple, Moses Ball and Mary Ann Butler. I don't know from which one of the two it came from. Um, now, just to, to uh, end, I just wanted to um, give you some examples of uh, some stories which illustrate the power of um, genetic genealogy. Uh, so this is a story about um, a, the, a Kevin Battle, um, who uh, was adopted as a child, and he always thought he was an orphan. And he went, uh, he tried to go back to Ireland to find out about his heritage, went to the... Uh, the nuns, the Sacred Hearts uh, home where he was born, and the nuns said they had, you know, they had, they turned him away at the door. Um, but he uh, eventually tested and had a match with a first cousin in Wales. And from the first cousin match in Wales, he was able to um, be to find that he had five half siblings in the database four of whom were still living. Sadly, his, they, his mother had um, died a few years ago, but he went back to Wales and was able to be reunited um, with, to, 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 to meet his uh, half-siblings for the first time. And sadly, his mother had been looking for him for her entire life. Um, when Kevin went, uh, the, Kevin's birth certificate was falsified, it had the wrong name on, and it turned out it was a really sad story because his mother desperately wanted to keep him. Um, and she'd run away from the uh, from the mother and baby home, and the nuns went after her about a year later and stole the baby back again. And he was then sold to America to a young couple who'd had a uh, who'd lost their baby, and they for a donation of one thousand pounds to the to the Catholic Church. Um, so there are stories like this being uncovered all the time. So it's anyone who's adopted, they now have a really good chance, and don't, they don't have information about their birth family, they have a really good chance of finding the answers through DNA testing, through matches. And there are some, in some cases, there are people who, when they take a DNA test, they open up their match list and immediately they will find in their match list a parent or a sibling. And the other thing that um, DNA testing is now being used for is for solving crimes. And you'll be hearing later on today from Barbara Ray Venter, who um, single-handedly has transformed how crimes are, um, are solved in, in America by using a website called GEDmatch. So this is a volunteer website. You can, so you have to, it's not using any of the commercial databases. So people voluntarily upload their results to GEDmatch. And then what um, Barbara was doing, she was using the matches to um, identify cousins and then reconstructing family trees to identify the name of the suspect. And she'll go into all the details of that uh, later on today. And foundlings are the other, uh, also are people who are finding answers through DNA testing. And previously, if you were a founding, you would have no information at all whatsoever about your family. Um, Julia Bell has done a lot of uh, DNA detective work on founding cases. And there was a story published earlier this year about a lady called Anthea Ring. And she was uh, left on the South Downs in the south of England. Um, under a blackberry bush and uh, essentially left to die. But uh, fortunately, a family were um, walking past. They heard the baby cry and they rescued the baby and she was then uh, eventually put up for adoption. So when DNA testing uh, was started, Anthea just took a test really just to find out about um, her ethnicity and she came out with quite high percentages of Irish uh, DNA. And Julia offered to, uh, to help her with her search. And eventually she started to get some matches coming in that provided some answers. So she had a, a it was a closish cousin match and they, they were eventually able to narrow down the, the mother and um, Julia bought, I don't know how many different birth certificates and eventually was able to connect all the, all the names together. And then um, they were trying to work out who the father was and it was narrowed down to four brothers and the, the surname was Coyne. Um, for, uh, this is, I think it's Galway and County Mayo, um, and of the four brothers, two tested, and they, they were ruled out because they didn't share the right amount of DNA to be the, the half-sibling relationship. 
sorry, the, the parent-child relationship. And then they, they, there were two others um, where they had no descendants. But in one case, they had a letter and they were able to extract, they sent off some for that for testing in, in pioneering a new technique and they were able to extract some DNA from the letter and that was sent off for testing and that came back as a match with one of the brothers. So now even though the, the father is not alive, Julian knows the name of her father, she knows the name of her mother and all through the power of DNA testing and large matching databases. So I said Julu, I meant to say um, Anthea. Um, so I just put up a list of resources there that um, will help you, um, and you can get all those from the PDF. And um, that's the end. So if you have any questions, if you wanted to take a photo of that, but it's best to get the, uh, the PDF if you want to. Great. Thanks very much, Debbie. When do you have time for your own family tree research? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had much time recently. <laughs> I think that's a big problem with, for anybody who gets heavily involved in mm -hmm. DNA testing and then becomes speakers, like yeah. Debbie, um, is that it, it takes a long time to, it take, you don't have time to do your own family tree research. Mm. Um, so quite a few people here in the room have actually done a DNA test. <clears throat> um, what, um, who has got a question for, for Debbie or a general question for the, yeah, come over here. Um, you mentioned in connection with Y-DNA that to get matches, it's best to register with a surname project group. Yep. Is that the only way? Because it presupposes that the surname is the correct uh, uh, trace of origin. No, no. You, there are lots of geographical projects. So even if there's no surname project, you can sign up with the Ireland DNA project. Um, or you can just test in the, in the database. Um, so you, you have to take the test first and then you can join projects when you've tested or you can, if you order online, you, if you order through a DNA project, you get a reduced price when you order the test. But if, if there's not a surname project for you, then just join the geographical project. And you can actually join multiple projects. So if, you, if your surname is one surname, you can join that project. And then if it turns out that's not your surname from 200 years ago, you can join the other project as well. But it depends, each project ha has its own entry criteria, so you have to comply with what the, 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 the project says. So some projects are more um, lax about entry requirements than others, and if it's a different surname, sometimes people will set a much higher standard. So I would normally only allow people in my project with a different surname if they had a match of at least 67 markers. And of course, there's not just geographic projects, but there's haplogroup projects as well. Oh yes, I didn't mention those. Yes, once you know your haplogroup, you can join your haplogroup project. And then a lot of people do actually get very involved in the in the, in the, the, the SNP testing for haplogroups. And there's advanced tests like the big Y test that you can now take, which is really coming right down to the the present day. Uh, but that's much more expensive. It's um, something like five hundred. Is it five hundred dollars now? We've got a special show price. What's the special show a, price? There's a hundred dollars off the right, big white okay. test. So, so you, it normally would be six hundred and fifty if you yeah. hadn't done any testing previously. Now it's five fifty. But if you've already done Y one hundred and eleven, it's down to three hundred and fifty dollars. So mm. that's quite a, yeah. a discount. Yeah. So I think that is what's going to in the future. Where ev everyone will be doing the big Y testing, but it's not at a price yet that is affordable for most people. But um, in the long run, that is, is the way to go. And of course, the advantage of being in a haplogroup project is that the haplogroup project administrators have a much greater overview of your particular branch of the tree of mankind than you will have just as a surname project administrator. So it's very, very important, especially if you're running a surname project, that you encourage all your project members to join the relevant haplogroup projects and there probably will be several of them, so that you get a better overview of what your DNA means and who it hooks into. Mm. So for example, in my Farrell DNA project, it was the haplogroup project administrator that pointed out that my Farrells were related to a bunch of Harolds. So how are the Harolds and the Farrells related to each other? It's because when they went over to um, America, uh, the, uh, the, the Irish for Farrell was O for all, but if you put a H in front of it, it becomes O'Harrell. And that's how the Farrells became the Harrells. Yeah. And there's a very, very clear genetic link between them. Yes. Uh, of course, the Harrells in America, when we told them they were Irish, they were very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> We've another question down here. Thank you. 
Greetings from Canada. Uh, I have a question when you showed the various slides with the matches, the various companies, yeah. and there's quite a range. How does one believe which one when it says suddenly you showed, I think, Romania and a few other areas, and then you're more British? How does that, how do you believe which one? Well, I think you have I think to... Donna, uh, Donna Rutherford had a very, very good uh, answer to that, and it was the, the correct one is the one that best fits your preconceived idea. <laughs> Donna's at the front, so I have, I have to give her acknowledgement for that. Debbie? Yeah, but it, it, each, it's to do with the way that the, um, the companies work the, those populations out. So each company compiles a list of reference populations. So what they're doing is they're not really telling you you're 50% Irish. They're telling you that we've got um, 30 populations in our database and we put them into clusters and you match this cluster with 50% of your DNA, you match this cluster with 20% of your DNA. And if your particular ancestry is not represented, then you will get another population instead. So I saw some results with someone from Ghana, all his um, grandparents were from Ghana, and he came out at something like 85% Nigerian. And when I looked at the reference populations, there were no reference populations for Ghana, and there was a reference population for Nigeria. So they were just matching him to the nearest population. So it, 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 it's a clue. Um, at, the, at the continental level, the results ca are reliable. Um, and if you've got something like Jewish ancestry, um, Jewish people are what we call endogamous, so they marry within their own community. So they, when you cluster populations, Jewish people show up as a cluster. So if you get results that show you are 50% Jewish, then that means you've got a Jewish father or Jewish mother or either that or two Jewish grandparents. But um, at the... Once you start getting down to the lower levels, it, it becomes much more difficult to distinguish people. And it all depends on which populations are in the database and um, how representative they are of that population as well. Because popul gen our genetics is not defined by country borders. And, you know, the population of Brittany is very similar to the population of um, Cornwall. And you've got a, all these boundaries. They're, they're not hard boundaries, it's all in, in climbs, gentle climbs. So um, I think the high percentages, certainly the continental percentages are reliable, and if you get high percentages of something like Irish, that's generally reliable. Uh, but as it drops down, and especially if you only get 1%, it, it's not generally, that's generally just noise. So one of my sons came out at 0.1% Native American with uh, one of the tests, despite having no ancestors who'd ever set foot in America. We have another question here. Um, from Dublin. <coughs> Just in relation to the Native Americans, because when my results came back from my heritage, there I was with a 1.2% Native American. Right. And of course, I was flabbergasted. Mm. But there are other people on my heritage who share my name and also have that same Native American connection. Now, I've emailed them, but they haven't come back to me. But yesterday I was watching some program and they were saying that. The, in relation to the lady, she's a professor and she thought she was a Native American and she heard <coughs> herself as being, there was a huge scandal over it. But this expert was saying that the Native Americans in, in like what we consider to be Native Americans are skewing DNA testing, they just haven't done it. So if you get a Native American <coughs> popping up in your DNA test, you're probably from the South Americas, somewhere like Peru or somewhere like that. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, yes, the reference yes. populations they use are generally from South America. <laughs> Um, so there are, there's a whole scandal of Native American testing. You've probably seen all the things about Elizabeth Warren and her Native yes. American test, where it's become yeah. a, like a sort of political hot cake. Um, so and because of the way that it, that uh, the way that the Americans are trying to sort of uh, appropriate that culture and claim Native American ancestry, and it's the same in Canada as well. A lot of people in Canada who claim that they are METI um, and they, they're, they're then trying to grab the land and tribal rights. Um, so you've got that whole culture be behind all this. So it's not surprising that the Native Americans don't want to test. There was one report, one article I came across, because I started looking it up then, like how could I possibly have Native American ancestry? Mm -hmm. And it said one professor in Cork was doing research on this because I have popped up for several people. And he said it could go back as far as 15,000 years ago when the Bering Straits were there. 
and you had a group of people coming along and one turned north and one turned south and that's how like at the time it wouldn't be considered Native American yeah. but possibly it could be in your DNA for as long as 15,000 years would that show up still today? Yes, it, well ago? it could be because it depends on which markers they're using for, you know, the, to identify this Native American because they, they may only be cons considering the American population but we uh, Europeans and Native Americans share common ancestry as you said like 15,000 years ago um, and so you've got you know, one group went west, one group went, went east, and so those markers could actually be those shared markers from all that long, long time ago. Um, but there, there were Native Americans who came over here, so um, I don't know if anyone's read Adam Rutherford's book, he's actually got an ancestor who was a Native American, um, who was you know, going around touring, I think it was circuses or something. Um, but it's still the question, you know, even if you get a tiny trace of Native American, is that actually from that ancestor, or is it just Asian DNA? Um, it could be, you know, as you say, from many, many thousands of years ago. Another question here? Um, my uncle did the Y-DNA test. Hold the microphone right up to your mouth. Uh, my auntie did the Y-DNA test with Ancestry some years ago, and Ancestry were just doing that test. And of course, they've dropped it now. Yeah. I have transferred his results to uh, family tree DNA, but do you know, do Ancestry keep the samples? Um, they apparently do have the samples. There were rumours that they'd been destroyed, but they've still got them, but they haven't decided what to do with them the last time I heard. But apparently they're not in very good condition, and people who've asked have not had any success in getting the samples. It, it may be worth trying to write to them, but I cannot guarantee success. And um, I was interested then to hear about a letter being used for DNA mm. extraction. Is that very expensive to do? Um, there is a new company, an Australian company called To The Letter DNA, which has just started, just set up doing that. And the other company that was doing it is Living DNA, um, who are supposed to be launching a new test later on this year. But I think it's going to be something like 500 euros. Um, to, to do a test like that and it's still very experimental if you look at the two letter DNA website they've got a blog and they, they're running through different tests at the moment and trying to work out the methodology so it's, you can either choose to be a pioneer and send a sample off and maybe not get results or wait a few years until it's all settled down and uh, there's a better chance of success and does the letter get destroyed when they're doing it? Um, well, they take it off the, it's, it's not the letter, it's the stamp itself. It's the back of the stamp where they're trying to extract the DNA. Yes. But you just have to accept whatever they, they do with the, with the letter to get the DNA, if that's what you want to uh, doing. I'm sure they will do their best to be um, as least invasive as possible. Yeah, thank you very much. In fact, with that particular case, with the anti-ring case, they, they went, with, they took the envelope went inside and approached the stamp from inside the envelope, scraping away the paper until they got to the gum of the stamp, which they hoped had been licked by the person of interest, and the DNA had been preserved in the gum, but it took them four attempts to actually get yes, a reasonable yeah. reading. Yeah. So it's still, you know, highly iffy. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the type of DNA that you're going to get from that is likely to be mitochondrial DNA, if they're um, not necessarily autosomal DNA, although they did get autosomal DNA in the Anthea Ring case. Um, but it, there's, there are thousands of mitochondria in every cell, so there's a much greater chance of getting that than any other type of DNA. But the new techniques, the next generation sequencing, are much better at extracting these like, small little segments of DNA from the, the, um, from the information. Hi, I'm from Dublin, um, and you mentioned uh, the uh, combination of, uh, in, in genealogy, the combination of DNA and, uh, and record research. Um, one of the frustrating things about um, you know, you, looking at matches is there are so many people who, um, who uh, have put matches on, on databases that they don't have a tree or a jet comp to accompany. And it seems to me that um, if you want to take, you have to give. And I just wonder whether you would agree that um, 
that it's essential that if you if you're going to if you want to learn something from your DNA that you actually um, also have to display <coughs> what you know about your family tree. Well, first of all, a lot of the, some of those people may not actually have trees that they can share. If they're adopted, they they won't be able to produce a tree. There are because of the mark the increase in DNA testing, we've got a lot of people now who are testing not because they're genealogists, but because they're tempted by the advertising to find out how Irish they are or how um, Native American they are or whatever. So um, the, it's now the challenge is to convert those people who are testing into becoming genealogists. Um, and it's really everyone's choice as to what, you know, what they do with their results and what genealogy research they do. But even if you don't have a tree for someone, there's still a lot you can do to, just by the name and by looking at things like the shared matches on Ancestry DNA, the shared matches are the most powerful tool because if you, sh if you have a match with someone who's got no tree and you see the shared matches and some of those matches have trees, you can then narrow down and work out who they are. So in some of these cases, you know, like the Golden State Killer, it's worked out, and in, in a lot of adoptee cases, it's worked out, they don't contact the matches, some of them don't have trees, but it's just worked out purely on these networks of matches. And the more people are, who are in that network of matches, the easier it becomes to identify someone. And I was able to identify a second cousin recently, um, who just by the name, um, just by going from the shared matches, and I knew it had to be related on my mother's side. I knew it had to; they had to have the surname Ball or Saunders. And just by tracing the, fam the surname back again in the family tree, I worked out exactly who she was. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks, Debbie, for your sharing your expertise. Please give a warm thank you to Debbie. Kelly. The next presentation will be on the Tune Babies. That will happen in the next five minutes, and um, we will see you at that point in time. That's great. Thank you. Just to mention that the show guide with all of the DNA lectures schedule is available downstairs. Um, it's on page 10 of the show guide, so you'll see all the lectures there.